learning new things. Um, some things have advantages, some have disadvantages. I'll talk about some of my favorites. Um, and then a report. And a report is kind of, in my opinion, something you should do the entire time. I don't think you should try to do this and then at the very end, let's see, what did I do today? It's something that, uh, you know, I'd say 1240, I did this, you know, find this, one o'clock, I found this, you know. Keep tabs because if you do this all day, you're, you're not going to remember most likely by the end of the day. So where's the sources of evidence? Uh, network traffic, the data, of course, data itself. Uh, network traffic is flow. Uh, collecting traffic and then analyzing the flow. Uh, bits transferred, packets transferred, protocols transferred. Uh, you can use that to monitor users. You can use that to monitor uh, what types of protocols are being used. Uh, system logs, user data, application data. What are the users doing on the machines? And then the infrastructure logs, where are they connected from? You know, is it uh, local clients? Is it remote clients? Um, and then tying the knot, putting it all together. Pulling from these various sources of data is going to allow you a lot prettier picture when it comes to date, time, user, domains, uh, connection duration, data transfer. You know, does somebody, uh, you see a connection, where are any bytes transfer? You know, things like that. Uh, and then IP address, MAC address, hopefully that will help you tie everything together. With uh, the network traffic acquisition, different ways to do it. Again, uh, there's passive acquisition. So if you say you don't have a, an IP address on a port, and you just sniff promiscuous mode and just pull everything in like from a span or from a tap, uh, that would be ideal. Um, it's not always possible. So some cases are cache poisoning. You are making uh, a footprint there. But if, if it's data that you need to get, then you need to get it. Also uh, serving as a proxy. And again, with all this stuff, of course, uh, you should go without saying, if you have permission, make sure you have permission to do any of this stuff. But I'll just throw that out there since, since I'm on camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the network data, I'm sorry? So sniffing traffic on a span, um, say there's a device uh, like a switch and you're connected to a switch port, rather than just pull, usually the way a switch operates, you familiar with the way a switch yes. operates? Okay. So instead of having uh, just your data, you know, have a span so that it directs uh, data from other links to your link, uh, basically mirrors traffic. Yeah, basically like a switch, you know, like the main difference that you'll see between a switch and a hub. A hub just broadcasts across all ports. Switches aren't supposed to do that. So in theory, let's say that I need to sniff traffic that's going through, like we've got three or four links here, and I want to sniff all the traffic coming off of these four ports that go to sever, land segments. You would uh, want to take the four ports and actually either mirror or span them. To another port, and they would communicate to up your Ethernet cable for that, and then that would allow all that traffic that's going in and out of those ports to also be broadcasted on that port you're connected to. So you can sniff it. Perfect. So you have to distinguish the ports. You have to figure the switch first to sniff. Yes. Yes. You, you would. Um, um, and keep that pretty simple. With a with a tap, a tap too. Uh, that just is, is essentially like a hub. It allows free flow of, of traffic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, network data. What, what kind of stuff do you expect to see, and what type of stuff might be usable? Application data again, the web, FTP. Um, see what they're doing. This session data, um, cookies. You know, um, as far as with the pen test, this is especially applicable. I've seen some nice programs for. Um, trying to guess cookies, like cookie hijacking basically. Um, how are they, you know, what method are they using? That'll be in the, the session data. Port data, uh, that helps find out kind of traffic flow too. You know, if you see port 80, there's a good chance that that's a web server. Is the traffic coming from port 80? It's probably HTTP response. 
um, IP data addresses, right? But also the routes. We talked about routing protocols operate at layer three, the, the network layer. So with that, when you have uh, you GRP or RIP or OSPF, all that data is going to be at layer three. Data link data, that's your VLANs or your like uh, 802.1Q VLAN information, uh, VTP, uh, which is VLAN trunk protocol, trunk information, and STP, spanning tree protocol. Uh, there's tools like your Cinea that will actually allow you to uh, become well, what's called the root bridge, spanning tree, hijack their switches, basically, um, become the become the, the main switch. Um, but but all of this points to other other hosts, other networks, other areas that you you might overlook in some cases. Uh, network flow again, activity it could be user activity, it could be uh, a whole group's activity. You know. This is good whether you're trying to find malware. Whether you're trying to find where's all my bandwidth going, why am I having all these redirects, uh, why does my phones keep dropping calls? Uh, network flow analysis is is pretty much good for anybody that, that has to use the network. Uh, it's just a picture of of in Wireshark. They have a protocol hierarchy statistics, and it just clear blam. Uh, they also have uh, tools for for mapping your traffic flow. And that'll allow you to put in filters and do statistical analysis with a click. Uh, but this is real handy. I like pulling this up a lot of times. And in this, you see in this case, uh, UDP is almost 10% of the traffic. Um, it's all just data. Yeah, you see a little U turn there. Uh, but that, you know, it might take some looking into it. It's, 10% of the packets, and it's not it's not running a streaming video or anything. Um, so I, just a quick glance. I use the protocol hierarchy a ton because if you have a huge PCAP file, you have so much data, you can look at this really quick, and you can apply any of those as a filter just to see the data that you want to see. So if you just specifically want to look at the UDP, that 10% right there, you can just right click, apply as a filter, and you can put that filter in without you having to you know, put it in. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so placement. So we, we talked about uh, passive or uh, active traffic acquisition. But how do you acquire this traffic in the first place? So this is a uh, you know what a typical network might look something like: uh, switches, firewalls, and then routers to the gateway. Uh, where do you where do you start? You know, ideally, uh, the closer you can get to the source of the traffic, the better. Part of this goes into design. When the network's designed, did they fill up all the switch ports, or did they say, you know, maybe one day we'll want to sniff traffic and, and troubleshoot some problems and kind of allocate some space for that? Maybe already prepare some spans. Um, so that's something to check on. But sniff placement makes a, an enormous difference in the, the quality of data that you're able to receive. So uh, other information, logs, have uh, syslog, SNMP, the most common logging types, uh, Windows, you have the event log. Uh, we use uh, a product called Event Assist that converts event logs to uh, syslog messages, and that's a really handy tool. Uh, then other logs on Linux that might be of interest, your messages. Uh, Varlog messages, Varlog syslog, Varlog mail log, or pretty much anything in Varlog is going to apply there. Well, what kind of stuff do you get from logs? Uh, you might get user activity. Are they sending mail or are they receiving mail? You know, are they uh, connecting to a device or a device is connected to them? What kind of applications are they running? What users are doing this? Where are uh, directories and files, maybe web server files that are causing errors. Um, all this is just sitting in the log files. Here's an example of a Windows log. Mute it. Uh, that's converted to syslog. It kind of puts it in there with the pipe symbols. But you see you have the address of the device sending the log. Uh, Damon, notice, notice. Timestamp, 2013. Security auditing program that sent it. 5140 is the Windows event. 
it tells you what happened. The network share object was accessed. Uh, account name, Triton domain, Joe's books. So just from this piece, you know that there's a share at 10.5.122. Uh, you know who accessed it. All this data. Linux logs. So DHCP. See a DH client. Uh, the program being run is the date and time. So if you're going back and you're trying to uh, say do an investigation and you want to pin somebody to a specific place, specific time, um, you had that address. Cron, you see the CD directories right there. So live by the sword. You know, tool, tools of the trade. I mentioned. Uh, I named a couple of tools, TCP dump, uh, T Sharp, those two are pretty much staples, I believe. Uh, I think they come preloaded on most systems, uh, most Linux systems. Uh, foremost, if you're familiar with that, it's a file carving utility. And it can do some pretty neat things. Uh, with Wireshark, you can um, save files, save objects, export them from Wireshark. But if you do an MD5 uh, check, versus original, it likely won't match. If you use something like Foremost and you do the MD5 check, it'll match up. So if it's just for general analysis, you know you can use Wireshark and export. If you you have to have this for uh, legal purposes, you can suggest something more like Foremost. And I'd suggest any of these tools you decide to use. If you have to use it for uh, again the, the type of litigation, verify beforehand yourself that you get the expected results. So is Formos for carving through a PCAP or is it carved through lots of stuff with it? Okay. Your PCAP is free? Awesome. It's free. It is free. Oh. Uh, DriftNet. You can run DriftNet. It'll pull out pictures and different stuff as, as people surf or whatever. Uh, P0F is a passive fingerprinting tool. It does passive OS fingerprinting. So you can run POF, uh, no address. Just run the tool, listen promiscuous mode. And just pull information, and it will take. Uh, there's a database dash f option for a file, and it's a database of known formats for different things. And we'll get into that more later. And again, Wireshark. So with Wireshark and TCP dump, you have a, a concept of filters. What filters do is they provide you the ability to limit the traffic that you're capturing. We mentioned uh, networks with a thousand people. You know, that's not uh, too unrealistic in some instances. Uh, but even 100 people or 10 people, the, the volume of traffic that can be generated, uh, if, if you've never sat and looked at it, it's pretty incredible sometimes. So what filters allow you to do is, uh, for one, to limit the, the type of data that you're capturing. Maybe you only want data from a certain host because you're troubleshooting this one machine. You know, or maybe you just want to know about the activities on one machine. Or ports. You know, you might be limiting uh, UDP, uh, 453, so DNS. Uh, BPF is used by TCP dump, and that's also used in Wireshark with the uh, capture filters. Wireshark also has a neat thing called display filter. So as you're actively sniffing traffic, there's a bar across the top. And uh, just as, as Brent mentioned, filtering out traffic, you know, click a button to do this. Um, Wireshark, while you're capturing, you can say, hey, that looks interesting. It's uh, port 80, okay? TCP.port equals equals 80, bam. And it'll just filter out that traffic while it's still capturing, or you can do it after you've stopped just on a, a dead file. Now, is this a good time to pause? You want to pause and let everybody? Sure. Okay. Yes, <laughs> so, uh, we're going to we're gonna get into a demo here after, after everybody grabs some stuff. Wow, they're awesome. <laughs> Yeah. 
syntax for display filters uh, and, and if you never used it it's, it's kind of intimidating at first um, but when you start typing it has drop down box and options it's, it's really uh, really intuitive at that point so uh, when I first started looking into this type of stuff a uh, professor told me uh, take a surgical approach you know you have one and a half million packets how do you find the packet you're looking for? You, you can't just surgical approach, and and I've taken that kind of to heart. And uh, if we're getting into the routing demo, I want to talk about kind of setting up your your tools beforehand so that they're how you like them. And I want to show you how I like using a uh, large chart. So there's some options. Um, go under View, Time Display Format. Uh, you can use things like Seconds Since Previous, uh, Display Packet, Display or Capture Packet. And that'll help you find things like latency in the network. So you go to a web page and you see a SIN uh, in the SIN ACK, ACK, and you look at the times between the displayed packets. And you can say, OK, well, that's from this end, or that's from the server SIN. Uh, a little more practical might be since um, the beginning of capture. So we'll go from that. And I have it incremented in milliseconds. That's typically what you see when you're doing uh, pings and things like that. So it kind of keeps everything on the same page there. And also, uh, it's not really apparent here. This is a SSL session. Um, but Wireshark has a thing called subdesectors, and subdesectors will allow you to uh, rebuild streams of data. 
So as, as network traffic's transmitted, you know, obviously it's going to be uh, you're going to lose traffic, you're going to retransmit. Things are going to be, you might have uh, packet three, then packet one. TCP puts everything in order. And so these subject sectors, they'll put everything in order when it's displayed to you. So if you go to edit, preferences, protocols, and this will give you an idea too of uh, kind of the scope of Wireshark. Maybe. <laughs> Jinx me, champ. It did. Yeah, hey. It's alright, I got another There's a copy right here. So lots of protocols. Um, we're going to look for IP. All right, IP4. Uh, reassemble fragment IP4 datagrams. Okay, make sure it's checked. We're going to go to TCP. Allow subsector to reassemble TCP streams. Make sure that's checked. And UDP. No, it's good. So it's usually checked by default? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I, I might be wrong. I, I'll always have it checked. Always check them. So I, I could tell you. Um, and then here's just real quick protocol hierarchy we were talking about uh, earlier. So the first uh, demo I want to get into here. It's all routing, routing protocols. Uh, we mentioned before that the layer three, the network layer, you have IP, ICMP, and then all your routing protocols operate in that layer also. I uh, had a, a client once that wanted to uh, communicate with dynamic routing protocols with a uh, Linux server. Okay, I uh, started doing some research and found uh, some software called Quagga and Zebra. I don't know if some of you might be familiar with it. And it's a uh, software that allows you to run routing protocols as if you're on a, uh, you know, a Cisco router or whatever the case. Um, but let's do it from your, from your Linux box. Let's open up the terminal here. Okay, First, I'll show you the config call. So, with Quagga, there's a daemons file. The daemons file is going to say, uh, are we using RIP, are we using OSPF, or what, are, what protocols are we using? And then you want your, your protocol configuration file, and that will get loaded into memory just as it would on a, on a routing device. Uh, then your Zebra configuration file. That's going to be all of the, the general router configuration. So if, if you're familiar with routers, uh, you probably follow me. If not, most routers, when you log in, you'll have uh, certain things you can do. You can look at interfaces. You can look at configurations. Uh, you go into another mode to manage your dynamic routing protocols. Um, so the way this is broken up, 
is so that the Zebra is just the basic interface. Uh, and then whether you're using OSPF or RIP or whatever, that's separated. Yes, sir. Uh, CP isn't really a routing protocol. It's Cisco Discovery Protocol. Um, it, it doesn't do uh, EIGRPs. It's a Cisco, and it doesn't do that that I'm aware of. Uh, I'll show you the SPF configuration. <clears throat> this is real simple. There's not, not a whole lot to it. Um, basically, network command. And the format of all this is done automatically once you log in. So I have this this device, um, another machine here. <laughs> okay, you see this one has two interfaces. It has interface on the 192.168.40 and 145 network. It also has interface on 192.168.99.1. So two totally separate networks. Uh, mask, it's 255.255.50, so there's only one through 255 available on each one of those. So they're completely isolated. Now we just did a route before. The route before it showed two routes. Now we got this other route for 99. Where that comes from, right? That's what OSPF and these other dynamic routing protocols allow you to do. As soon as you run it, they'll meet up together and talk and exchange routes. So what we're going to do is kill it. Okay, that'll kill all of our routes. Okay, now let's capture See lots of traffic already, VNC, all kind of stuff. Simple display filter, OSPF. Okay, those are all coming from 140, 145, and 99.1, which are on the same device. Okay, so let's run this log again. Start it. Okay, now we start seeing traffic from 140-129 to the hello packet. Now they're forming what's called an adjacency. They're going to link up and share routes. Now, if you've ever uh, been any type of like a school network or a company network, pretty good chance that this is going by all the time. Why does why does this matter, right? Why, why am I going through all this trouble? Uh, because we're talking about layer three and the routes. Right, you see this data in here. Um, you can learn about other networks, and in fact, that's what uh, that's what we've done here is added a route to routing table. So. Basically, you, you can put Quagga on any Linux device in the network, sniff traffic. Oh, they're using OSPF. Okay. What area are they using? Area zero. Okay. Configure your device, and now you're talking routes with them. So if you're doing, a, say, an in-map scan of a network and you have 254 hosts, uh, now you've potentially added 254 more hosts. So that's the routing. Let's talk about uh, the passive fingerprinting. Talk about P0F. P0F has some functions to um, look at traffic 
and identify uh, potential operating systems, potential services. Uh, if you've used NMAP, you know, NMAP has, has features that will look for, um, you know, OS fingerprinting, that type of thing. IP, ICMP, TCP, UDP, they're defined by RFCs to request for comments. And they're pretty much the same in a lot of ways. There's, a, there's places where the specifications are kind of left open. So I uh, apologize if that's too small. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, source and destination addresses of, of IP options. Those are kind of obvious ones everybody looks at. Uh, protocol version, right? Is it uh, IP4, is it IP6? Next layer protocol, uh, TCP, UDP. And again, with protocol version, that could also be ICMP or EIGRP or, or anything. Um, the TTLs, so Linux, when you do a ping from Linux, as uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, if I do ping localhost, my TTLs are all 64. Okay. If I go to, say, a Windows box, TL128. So if you're sniffing traffic on a network, any IP data that goes across is going to have that TTL. TTL is so that when things are sent out across the internet, they'll just bounce around forever. It's time to live. You know, how many hops before it dies? And the TTL is decremented at each hop along the way. So if, if I'm connecting to myself, it's not going to decrement the TTL value. If I'm connecting to a router two hops away, it'll decrement it once for each hop. If I'm going to China and it takes 30 hops, it's going to be 30 less. So as we said, Linux is 64. Uh, if, if we get a, an IP value that's 40, is it more likely that it's a Solaris machine, a Windows machine, or a Linux machine? Uh, they say most most anywhere on the internet is between what is it 15 to 20 hops, so that's kind of a good gauge to go by, and we have enough uh, difference there that it's highly unlikely anybody's going to go 80 hops to get to you. Um, so TTL, that's a good place to start for passive fingerprinting. <laughs> IPID field uh, set to zero on some PMTUD systems. PMTUD is Path Maximum Transmission uh, Unit Discovery. Uh, that's used by systems that set uh, a value called Don't Fragment. Uh, they set that, and then as they send the packet out, it goes along. When it reaches a destination that uh, needs to fragment it, it will send back an ICMP message um, to fragment data, and then you redo the fields. But certain systems do PMTUD and some don't. Uh, MTU, uh, maximum transmission unit. Ethernet, 1500. If you do uh, any any of these captures we're doing now, go back and look at it. I uh, can almost bet that it's going to be 1500 for the uh, MTU because it thinks it's hooked up to an, an Ethernet link. Um, DSL, 1492. So by looking at the MTU, you can also get an idea of where this connection came from. Um, IP timestamps. IP timestamps um, on some machines can can reveal uptime. If you connect to, say, you do five uh, pings in a row, uh, each spaced out by a second, and then you look at the time in each response, um, the difference of that is going to be the, the clock rate on the computer, and then you can use that to compute the time. And I put it in this HP3, and this will just ping uh, that host five times, once a second, and then that will give you an idea of the time. HP3 does the, the timestamp guessing to server uptime. And we mentioned POF, uh, passive finger 
printing and, and in-map options. Flags, TCP operates, uh, we talked about connections being established, UDP, fire and forget. TCP uh, does what's called a handshake, it sends a SIN, it receives a SIN act, and it follows up with an act and establishes a connection. Certain flags uh, work together, such as SIN act, certain flags don't work together. A FIN or a reset might be used to tear down a connection. Uh, if you're seeing connections coming in with SIN, FIN, ACK, reset, probably not valid. You know, it's probably somebody doing a port scan to see how you're going to respond to those, those irregular packets, those regular flags. Uh, so combinations and responses. Uh, and this, again, just by watching other machines on a network, not necessarily actively engaging, but also actively engaging um, sending flags. Source destination ports. Um, we mentioned HTTP earlier. That's port 80, uh, FTP 20 and 21, uh, SMTP is 25. By looking at ports, source, and destination, give you a good idea of who initiated the traffic, who's the server, who's the client. Ephemeral ports, those are ports that are set uh, just kind of by the system. So when you connect to a web server on port 80, it doesn't really matter what port the traffic's coming from, what the main concern is where the traffic's going. So your system will select a port. Uh, with NAT connections, you usually see a lot higher uh, ephemeral port numbers. If you do stuff locally, uh, you might see port 2000 or something. If you start looking at NAT connections, you're probably going to see 61,220 or something like that. Uh, sequence and acknowledgement numbers. Uh, we'll really get into that. Uh, it can be used for session hijacking. Uh, select acknowledgement. Can skip over that. Timestamp. Uh, Timestamps are good for uh, again if this is for investigatory purposes. Timestamps are always good. Uh, and the window size. The window size will vary between operating systems also. So I mentioned Linux 2.0 and less. Uh, what it does is it, it takes the MTU, the max transmission unit, and it multiplies it by two. And then in the later versions of Linux, they take that value and they multiply it by 11 or 22. So if you take uh, the value of the window size and start with Full of numbers with the MTU, you can determine it. You know, is that uh, Linux 2.0, Linux 2.2, or Windows 64,512? Uh, but again, depending on the application you use, some custom applications might set that manually for their specific purposes. Um, time will go. All right, I'm just kind of going to go over this real quick. We talked about. Uh, TTLs and TTLs get decremented at every hop. Uh, I did a ping on a couple different Google sites. Um, TTL 50, they're, they're all pretty consistent within each stream. So we, we can somewhat assume that if these servers are in the same location, uh, the TTL should be similar. <laughs> and we see things like 42, 50. Just from that, you can probably assume they're in a different geographical area. You're taking different routes to get there, and so you're getting your TTL values decremented at different rates. So, say you get a in-map scam uh, against yourself, and you're looking, and, and you have packets from uh, this 192, 168. Uh, well, this was 4.4.4.4. You have packets coming from there, packets coming from 8.8.8.8, packets coming from 192.168.140.129. Uh, go back, we'll look at the time to live, 64. So automatically we know that's a Linux machine. Uh, most likely, most likely. 8.8.8.8, uh, also 64. And 192, 168, 140, 129, 64. Now this is to be expected because they're in the same network. It's not passing through a router. It's just getting switched. So the TTL is never decremented. Okay? We go back to these. That doesn't make sense unless it's 64 hops away or unless it's 191 hops away. That, that wouldn't make sense. 
So this gives us an idea that the attacker came from the same machine and spoofed the other two addresses to try to hide the mix there. So it's just a test. We're going to do a trace route to 4444. So it's at least nine ops away. Um, 8888, it's at least 14 ops away. And that one, one hop, no TTL there. Uh, another wire short. Uh, Going to jump back to it now. Uh, we talked about some of the neat features that it has. So decode as. This is one that came in real handy. Uh, I was looking at some malware, and the traffic. Let's check. One more. Let me uh, pull up this packet capture and give us something to look at while I'm talking. Go for this one. Right. Four eighty one. Okay. So usually um, HTTP, you can expect to see it on eighty, maybe eighty eighty, if you're using a type of proxy. Um, but eighty one, kind of odd, odd port. So. This allows us to follow the stream. We can filter out the stream. Um, go back. We can also do a thing called decode as. We decode as. And we'll decode it as. It's a transport layer. Um, Destination 81. HTTP. Apply that. It's not the results I wanted. Let's see. <laughs> try, try, try again, right? This one. Okay, it's the capture. So, decode as. Can you really figure out the one? <clears throat> yeah. Transport layer. Just a piece. So it'll allow this traffic, which normally um, would be kind of garbage, uh, it allows you to uh, decode it as specific protocols. So once you've identified, if you see something uh, kind of out, out of the ordinary as you're going through it, like a uh, post right here, um, you say, well, maybe that's HTTP traffic. And this is easily decoded. It shows you the, the entire URI that was used, uh, the host. And actually, we can go backwards in this response stuff and see the window size. So, I'm live 46. So, what kind of what kind of server we think these guys are using? Probably a Linux server, yeah. Um, just keep moving along. Uh, last one I think will be interesting. So we're going to talk about decoding SSL. Why would you want to do this? Well, there's a number of valid reasons. Uh, I read a on a blog where a gentleman was talking about uh, how he dislikes the use of SSL in his environment because it makes it so difficult to troubleshoot because you can't see layers four and above. Right. Um, but there's, again, Wireshark comes to the rescue. 
when we were talking about um, setting up the different preferences, there's a pre preference spot for SSL. So we've got our protocols, find SSL, and it's the option RSA keys list. Okay. Looks good. Let's check it out. Uh, go. So I, I did this. Uh, it was a machine connecting to itself. Right, little background. That's why address one twenty seven zero zero one. Uh, the port is eighty. It's just like a standard web server, I believe. May have done four forty three. Let's try four forty three. And the protocol that we want to decode out of the SSL is HTTP. Now, there's no password used with this. This would be as if uh, you went to a uh, an SSL website. Okay. Apply. Apply. Okay. Now, before this was all gobbledygook. <laughs> And hopefully we'll find something usable here. All right, we found our HTTP traffic. You see the full GET request. So don't don't think that uh, SSL is is infallible by any means. As long as someone can get the key, they can get your traffic. Who would trust? The key, or does it have to have the key from the session? The, the key, well, if you get the key from the server, you can decode any traffic that goes to or from the server. So the idea would be to capture the traffic from the SSL to go back to the Apache server as the administrator is adding the key for the signal. Yeah. It'll not have to be just like the same words Excel and forty or going to a, a website and then you went back and got the public key off the website, the public server off the website. Because that's what they were using when they were doing their, you know, in the recession. But that would work too, right? Oh well. No, not with the public key. I think, I think they would have a separate separate key. Because you need the private key. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna need the private key. So if they're going to the outside oh. organization. That's uh pretty much all I got for you. Hope everybody got a little something from it. Does anybody have any questions about anything? No, come on. Test it. Get some questions. No, I didn't say that. All right, <laughs> 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 uh, go. Um, if I move too fast or anything, I'm sorry. If I move too slow through anything, uh, I guess deal with it. <laughs> uh, I really, yes, sir. So, so, can you give us an example of like a real world thing where you use these things? Where I use it, no. Um, say, say, uh, somebody has some proprietary, um, proprietary application or a patent idea or something, um, and it was within the network environment. So then they leave the job and they go to. Um, California, get a new job, and start printing up your product. You could do, uh, you know, image acquisition, disk forensics, uh, but also you could go back and look at networking logs to see if maybe file transfers, sexual harassment, uh, stalking. You know, go through mail logs, find out when the mail was sent, um, if it was actually what they say it was. Uh, and then this sort of thing with logging. Um, I don't know if I really touched on it, but remote logging uh, is, is, I believe, preferable. Uh, remote or centralized, different names. Uh, but that way, if, if an attacker is able to get in and compromise a machine, you haven't lost all your logs. As long as you can protect that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do actually. Uh, Sagan? Familiar with Sagan? Sagan allows you to uh, use the same same type of rules as Snort. Right? Um, with that, I've had people say, I want to know when this user, okay, here's an example. 
user connected to an FTP server from Belarus. No logon failure, successful login. Okay, that's bad. Tell the client, they're able to, to kill the session. But we want to know anytime, anytime that user tries to log in again. And this is a pretty large environment. So what we're able to do is I was able to write a rule for Sagan that says whenever you see this username, let me know. So now anytime the user tries to connect to FTP server, pops up, you get an alert, you know, I have the IP address, where's that one coming from? Oh, Latvia, okay. You know, or Iran or wherever. So it's, uh, it's good. It's all the logs. I mentioned a bit to Sys that sends all the logs from uh, Windows machines to our Linux servers, passes through Sagan, you know, just filter those signatures. That's great. Do you run regular reports off of that? It doesn't generate reports. Um, it can be it can be worked with any kind of uh, like base or snorby or anything like that. Um, then you can generate reports from there. Was it Eagle X do reports? Sorry, Eagle X server. I've used that uh, on Windows host doing IDS stuff. I've never generated reports or anything from it. Good question. I did use it for. Um, well, especially the wire sharing stuff like that. Well, uh, malware research, so uh, you know that malware environment's like it's <laughs> behavior is like before 81, and you don't get to see. Like, yeah. So it's extracting the executable so it's getting the. Yeah, that's it's like, especially with the malware likes to fuck around. He mentioned that. Here's, here's, all the, here's all the malware. Here's all the malware. Yeah, yeah, but the, this uh, file export objects, and as Travis mentioned, it just has three protocols here: um, HTTP. Anything moved over HTTP, it'll pull out. See where it came came from. Yeah. If it's like actually like a in the wild environment where you've got like a large corporate network, you get ready for that to be flooded with pictures. Yeah. Because you're going to have like every <laughs> single image that made up a menu is going to be there. Yep. One million Facebook pictures. <laughs> yeah, when I have anything else. Have you done the SSL decryption? I mean, you have a private key? I have just just in like a lab environment. I haven't done anything. <laughs> yeah, I have very useful if you're a lab Right. Because if you need to be able to tell what an API request is, that's a good way to do it. Uh, if you don't want to use a proxy in the middle or something like that. Yeah, right. I mean, you can use stuff like, you know, yeah, like Perp or Theorem's proxy or anything like that. That's actually pretty good. Uh, Google um, actually has a lot of really good developer tools in the browser. So a lot of you see network traffic, but let's say that you're trying to troubleshoot a bug that only occurs in IE. <laughs> you can use an external tool, obviously, but you know that is one option too. Is like if you don't want to put a proxy in the middle of it, uh, you don't want to interrupt the traffic. Because um, let's say in that case, time sensitive and the signal is going to put back in the expired real quick. Then what you do is you just pass a check through with this, and then you use a private key to decrypt this and see what happens. So this is actually a very useful tool for anybody. And again. If you're one of the web developers, you should have a private key. So, right. <laughs> Anything else? If there is, I'll be the lush afterwards. So, <laughs> I appreciate talking to you. Thank you for your time.
walking instruction. It's like in 19 minutes.